Well, have you ever been to a grocery store and selected a tomato that says hydroponic, locally grown? Well, today we have a treat for you because we're actually in a greenhouse in Stratford, Oklahoma, and we're going to show you just what that means, hydroponically grown. And the greenhouses are owned by Mike and Kelly Jeter, and joining us is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Welcome Hello. to Oklahoma Gardening. Thank you. Now, this is very exciting, especially to think about an operation like this in Oklahoma. But in visiting with you, I understand that there's a little bit of change in what we think about hydroponics. Initially, tell us what that word means, even, hydroponics. Well, initially, hydroponics was the science of growing things in water, like just water or like a gravel water in a gravel bed culture. Now, the definition has been changed mostly for marketing purposes to anything that's not grown in real soil, like a peat light mixture okay. or rock wool or perlite, okay. just anything not in real soil. Now you refer to your system as NFT? Yes. What does that mean? NFT is nutrient flow technique. Okay. And uh, tell us basically how it works, the, the overall system, where it comes from and how it gets okay. to the tomatoes. Okay. Uh, an NFT system is a closed system where all the water comes from a main tank that is pumped to the pipes, and it's a very small amount of water. That's why it's called nutrient film. You're not filling that pipe halfway full or anything. It's just a small film of water running through the bottom of the pipe, and uh, all the nutrients are mixed in that water, even all a lot of your micronutrients. Right. Because you've got to have everything in that water just like it would have in soil. Okay. And that's what NFT is. And then it, it recirculates back into yes. the original tank. Yeah. Now, your actual pipe is what? What are you using? This here? is just six inch sewer drain pipe. Okay. And you've is. got it at a slope. And tell us how the water comes in at a certain point, how it's constructed. The greenhouse is broke down into two runs where the main water from the main pump where the water lines come in. This this row here has two pipes. In the middle you have a water line and at the very north end there's a water line. And the water goes into the P V C pipe in a small black line. And that's how the water gets to it. Then it all drains back and goes back to the corner of the greenhouse. Okay. And then it's picked up again. And starts over. And starts over. Now, what about timing as far as, is the water left on consistently? No, we need to keep, get as much oxygen to the roots as we can. So we use a, an on-off cycle, like 10 minutes on, 5 minutes off. And that is related to each system how it is. Okay. But now, for ours, that works. Oxygen is important. So what, you have a couple of devices to get more oxygen in the water flow, right? Yes, we use a catfish bubbler, and that get, helps put extra oxygen in the water. And then the lines that actually supply the water into the PVC pipe also have an opening at the top. And when the water comes on, you hear a goosh, goosh, and it's actually picking up oxygen there also. Okay. Now, probably the most uh, critical thing is that you test the water regularly. What are you yes. testing for, and how often do you do something like that? We test the water once to twice a day for the soluble salts and the pH. Okay, and the salts are a result of your fertilizer, right. I guess, which could burn the plants. And the pH has an impact on if it will take the nutrients up. Right. Okay. It's very critical. Now, you also do, what, foliage tests to see if the nutrients are really getting in the plant? Yes, about once a month, whether we have a problem or not, we take a tissue analysis, and a few leaves are selected out of every, every house, not just one house, but every house, and it's sent off, and they do a tissue analysis, and I'll, it'll tell me exactly what part for me, and I have on every nutrient, so I'll know if everything's all right. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the plants and the growing. This is, as I understand, a particular variety grown for greenhouses, and why does it need to be different versus one we'd grow out in the garden? Uh, it doesn't have to be quite as tough of a plant. It can take uh, a controlled environment better because a, a plant that's in a perfect environment, diseases and things, it's also perfect for those. They're more disease resistant. The plant won't be probably as thick as you'd see one in your garden where you have to lift up the leaves and look for the fruit because for labor purposes when you're growing on a commercial scale, you want to be able to pick without lifting up every leaf and looking mm -hmm. so the plant's not quite as vigorous and thick and easier to work with. Okay, and it's indeterminate, so they're just gonna keep growing and growing right. and growing, right? A crop like this, if it was grown a year, the plant could be 30, 35 feet long. Okay, now tell us about your seasons as far as, are you growing during the hot part of the summer or? 
We are, but we're not growing in, we're not producing fruit. This crop was started in June. The seeds were sown approximately June 25th. And we sow them in a little rock wool cube. They come in a sheet. Mm -hmm. And we sow, we put one seed in each cube. Okay. And as soon as they get seven to eight inches tall, which the only reason for that is the pipe is six inches tall. Okay. As soon as they're that tall, then we just take the cube okay. and we just drop it down the pipe. Okay. And by that time, the roots will be very massive in this. And in a matter of a week, these roots will be grown together and where you can't even pull the plant right. out of the pipe. And it growing right in your nutrient solution yes. again. Yes. All right. Now, um, the other interesting thing is you do a lot of uh, tying and pruning, and mm -hmm. that's always a question for gardeners yeah. interested in growing tomatoes. Yeah. Tell us and show us a little bit about what you're okay. doing there. Um, when, we, when the plant starts growing, we have to start tying it immediately because they'll get heavy quick and they'll start laying over because you don't have soil or as much room to support it. We, we cut a small slit in our pipe. Some people will tie a knot on the plant, has a knot in it, and we start tying almost immediately to this twine. We have to keep it trained. It's very mm -hmm. important. So you can grow more plants in the greenhouse and so you can see what you're doing and work with it. We have to go through every week and tie and sucker. That's, it's very labor intensive. This right here is a small sucker. It comes out at the node. Here's another sucker right here. This is a sucker. This is your termin the terminal of the plant. You leave that. But every week we go through and break out these suckers. Okay. You don't allow any suckers whatsoever. You keep Correct. forcing it straight up. Right. Okay. And because of the technology on, on improving tomato varieties, uh, they're much more vigorous and uh, we'll get, you know, sometimes we'll have new growth coming out the blooms and we have to prune that. And we only want three to five tomatoes on each cluster depending on the time of the year. When we have a lot of sunlight, we'll leave up to five tomatoes on a cluster. Mm -hmm. And in the winter time, we have shorter days and not as much sunlight. We want three because we want big tomatoes. We don't want a whole bunch right. of little ones. This one is a good example of a mm -hmm. cluster that needs to be pruned. So each week we're tying and suckering and we're also cluster pruning. Okay. I only want four to five tomatoes on here, so I'm gonna pull off some of these. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave five. Okay. Now, that is, way, is that painful for you? No. <laughs> no, not at all, because I know if I don't do it, I'm picking twice as many, I'm clipping twice as many, stickering okay. twice as many. Okay. You, it cuts way down on your handling, right. and then you have beautiful tomatoes. Right. Now, the other thing that I found interesting, too, is the way that you have another process that you call lean and lower. Tell us what you're doing there. Okay. In order to grow the tomatoes for a long period of time, which this crop will go clear through the end of December, then we'll start another one, which will go through July. We, if that once they get to the wire, you, you can't reach them, you can't work with them, they have nowhere to go. So what we do is we tie extra twine on so that we can let the plant down. But in order to do that, we have to, to lean it also. We can't just let it straight down or the plant would break. And uh, So you're just shifting positions and the way you do that to move it up is you put a couple of them on this row, you hang them over here, and mm -hmm. you're just mainly going around right. in a circle, yeah. changing this, location. The row over here, the whole row leans that way. Okay. And this whole row leans the opposite way, so you just keep going mm -hmm. around. Very so interesting. A few of these plants have already been leaned that way, and what we're doing is we are letting it down, but I'm also taking this plant to the position that the plant before it was at. Okay. It's a little bit easier to work with. Yes. Now, Kelly, I'm sure that growing them in a controlled environment like this, it has to be very sterile, but you still have problems, I would assume, with, like, deficiencies, that type of thing. Are you having anything show up now? Yeah, we've had a little bit of zinc deficiency show up, okay. and that's a very minor element, but you'd be surprised what how much damage, okay. just a, a tiny bit of Just chlorosis of that. and the Yes, the and it stunted a few of the plants and slowed them down a little okay. bit. Okay. What about pests like uh, insects, diseases? Any problems? We don't have that many pest problems. We have had a little bit of white fly this year, and we've always had a little bit of pinworms, which is an yeah, insect they, you don't hear much about. Explain that to us, though. That's interesting, the pinworm. The pinworm starts out like a leaf miner. Okay. And 
it'll look like leaf miner damage and the worm is not a sixteenth of an inch long it's purple and okay. the moth is very small and it's hard to control because it actually does like a leaf miner in its early stages it tunnels between the layers of the leaf okay and then obviously white flies occasionally but what about diseases if a disease gets in the water system are you in trouble very much so. This is a closed system because all the water goes through, it goes back to the pit, and it recirculates. Okay. So a recirculating system is closed. And you get something on one plant, like for, say for example, we had bacterial canker one time, or if you had Pucerum crown rot, well that water's going to spread it quicker than like you'd be out in your garden. Through or the entire right. greenhouse. So okay. that's the main disadvantage to having a closed system. Well, all of that to get one of these. And yeah. you actually are harvesting vine ripe tomatoes. Now, you leave the stem on. What, what is the purpose? That we don't normally recommend that in the right. hobby. Yeah. Uh, this partially is marketing. This tells the customer that this is a, a greenhouse tomato. And because, uh, you know, they might want to grab another tomato and the person checking them out won't know well, mm -hmm. which tomato they have. But we leave that on there so that they'll know it's a greenhouse tomato and you don't have the wound of when you pull this off when you're picking all that moisture the tomato is going to lose out it the shelf life is short it's not going to last as mm -hmm. good so that's the two main reasons okay now we do have to snip the stem so that it doesn't poke function. the other tomatoes okay. but the sepal is left right. on and you are picking them at that stage but they will continue to ripen as i understand but there's a major problem that a lot of times before it gets to us as a consumer that kills a ripening process. And what would that be? A lot of grocery stores store them too cool. They'll put their tomatoes in the cooler with their lettuce and other things like a little above freezing or maybe 38, 40 degrees. And tomatoes ideally should be stored like 50 to 55 degrees. And that would be one that was already red. If you want it to keep ripening and turn red, it'd be like... 65 70 degrees is okay. ideal now you're selling throughout the state but you also have a little bit of retail where people can come by during the hours too i guess is that right yeah we we deliver to a lot of grocery stores in oklahoma city and we last year we started selling retail and have real good response to that well it's very exciting and i understand there's as far as we know just a couple of growers in the state that are doing this process so uh, we wish you the best and you've given us some great ideas and now we'll appreciate that tag a little bit more you have an interesting uh, little poster i noticed too that says something about all the time and energy and everything that you're putting into it and it really does show and yeah. we appreciate your time spending with us and if you'll uh, be sure and uh, stay tuned with us next week we're going to show you a little bit different variation and give you some pointers on hydroponic gardening for the hobby greenhouse. Thanks again, Kelly. Thank you.